Chapter 3. The Castle When Lannis awoke, the birds were singing cheerfully outside his window. The sun was making bright patterns on the floor, and a short, fat man was sitting comfortably on the foot of his bed. While Lannis blinked in surprise, wondering whether this visitor was part of a dream, the man smiled at him, a broad, happy smile that looked quite at home on his round face. "'Good morning, Lannis,' he said. "'You have slept late. The sun has been up for two hours or more, and breakfast is waiting for you below.' Lannis grinned in return, stretched, and swung his legs over the side of the bed. The short man went on. My name is Jammin. I am the senskull of the castle, the one who takes care of food, clothing, and other everyday matters for the king's soldiers. Your friend Robin had to leave early this morning for duties on the eastern ridge, but I'll look after you while he's gone. When Lannis had washed and dressed himself, Jammin led him to the great vaulted dining room where he ate a hearty breakfast. After breakfast, Jammin took him to the top of the castle towers. From this point, the view was breathtaking. Far below was the green, grassy area of the castle yard, across which moved the tiny figures of men and women. Across the yard rose the outer wall, topped with battlements where outlooks kept their watch. Beyond the wall on three sides of the castle, wooded ridges of the great mountains stretched away into the distance. On the fourth side, the wooded slope dropped away to the expanse of the broad valley with its checkered pattern of fields and villages. Lannis saw that the ridge on which the castle stood extended westward out into the valley. Along the side of this ridge, he could see, winding down into the trees, the path up which he had come the night before. In the thickly wooded part of the slope, the path was completely hidden by the foliage, but in other areas he could catch glimpses of it between the treetops. Jammin pointed downward. Our lookouts on the wall can keep watch over any of our soldiers who may be traveling the path from the valley. If their journey is at night, we can see the glow from their swords, even through the treetops, and tell at once if anything is wrong. How? asked Lannis. By the sword light. When the enemy is near, the light of the sword always flares high, warning the soldier of trouble to come. But Aslanus, doesn't the sword light always tell the enemy where you are? Wouldn't it be better to travel in darkness and slip past him unobserved? You don't know our enemies very well, said Jammin with a smile. They can see in the darkness far better than we can, for they are creatures of darkness. But they cannot see the light which the sword sends forth. That light is invisible to them, nor can they hear the notes of the silver trumpet, for the king planned it so. Lannis looked down at the sunlit treetops. Even with the memory of last night fresh in his mind, it was hard to believe that deadly enemies lurked in the shadows beneath those trees. He turned to Jammin. Were you watching us last night? he asked. Our lookout saw you, and when the light flared from Robin's sword, we knew the enemy was attacking. Soon afterward, Robin's trumpet call was heard in the watchtower on the ridge. Jammin pointed once more, and Lannis, looking out along the ridge towards the valley, saw on a high rocky point overlooking the path a circular gray stone fortress, around whose walls moved figures in the uniform of soldiers of the king. That fortress is our most important post, continued Jammin, for it keeps the way open to the valley. If the enemy could ever capture and hold it, he could control the path and stop us from carrying out our great mission, that of telling the people of Broad Valley about the king. Does the enemy attack it often? asked Lannis. In the early days of the faith, he laid siege to it many times. In recent years, he has not often attacked it in force, preferring to harry us in other ways. As you can see, the approach to the fort from this edge of the ridge is well protected by the castle. At the far end of the ridge, where it drops off into the valley, are great cliffs which form a natural barrier. The sides of the ridge are very steep and difficult to climb. It is not hard for rescue parties from the ridge to make their way down these slopes to the path where travelers are in trouble there, but it would be difficult for war parties of the enemy to climb them in enough force to capture the tower. Lannis looked thoughtfully over the valley. Tell me, Shaman, he asked. Why don't you tell the valley folks about those evil ones? They might help you fight them. Jammin shook his head. 
The evil ones can't even be seen without the sword, Lannis. The people of Broad Valley have been told about the evil ones. They have the work of the evil ones all about them. But because they can't see them, they won't believe. Why, Lannis, the evil ones have ruled over the whole valley for years without being found out. They don't rule over the village where I live, said Lannis stoutly. We are independent and rule ourselves. Janus smiled, but his eyes were kind. The influence of the evil ones is there. Tell me, lad, are there discontent people in your village? Well, yes, there are. Some are discontented because they want more money, and some because they want a different village government, and some for other reasons, but you find that in any village. And have you wars in your village, pursued Jammin? We've had many wars with other villages. Now we are at peace, but we fear we may be attacked soon and are preparing for it. But we are a peaceful people, replied Lannis. And is there thievery and selfishness and hatred in your village? Yes, but there are many good people too. And can you, think carefully, Lannis, can you think of one person, just one in your village, who is completely... 100% happy and satisfied and content. Well, no. Ah, Lannis, the conditions in your village are the work of these same evil ones. They move among you, spreading discontent and keeping your good villages so busy with wars and troubles that they do not realize that they are under the power of evil. That is why we go to the valley with the message of salvation. For it is only when men and women turn to the king that they find real peace and happiness and break the hold of evil forever. Then Jamin turned to the other side of the castle, which overlooked the heavily forested slopes of the great mountains. He began pointing out on the mountain ridges below the positions of the outposts which guarded the approaches to the castle from all directions. Each of these posts, he said, has its own area to guard and control. Each has its part to play in keeping the enemy from breaking through in force. While small numbers of the enemy still slip through to attack the king's soldiers on the path to the valley, these outposts prevent large war parties from closing the path completely. For several moments they stood there while Jammin's pointing finger traced out on the mountaintops below the carefully planned pattern of defenses for the castle. Finally, Lana said, This is wonderful, Jammin, all of it, and the castle is the most wonderful of all. Did your king build it? It was he who planned it, who laid the foundation of the building. The ground had already been cleared and prepared by such ancient warriors as Moses and David and Isaiah, whom the king had sent before to prepare for his coming. But these men did not know the king's design for the castle itself. Then the king came to the valley and with his own hands laid the foundations of the castle. And before he went away, he entrusted the rest of the building to a little group of his followers. These men, Peter, James, John, Paul, and the rest, became the first of the present-day soldiers of the king. They laid courses of stone upon the king's foundation and fought off the evil ones who tried to hinder the work. Those who followed them built more and more until the castle is nearly finished. Do you mean, asked Lannis, that all of the king's soldiers are stonemasons as well? Jammin laughed. Yes, stonemasons and many other things besides. We are a busy company. Lannis was silent for a moment. Tell me, Jammin, he said at last. How does one become a soldier of the king? For example, if I wanted to join your fellowship, how would I do it? Jamin looked at him seriously. You could be a soldier of the king only if you believe in him and are willing to give your life to his service. For he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jamin paused while his sharp eyes seemed to bore through Lannis. Then he said gently, You really know very little about us, Lannis. This life is a hard one, and there is much work to do. We have no time to loaf or to lie in the sun of a summer afternoon. Lannis blushed. How much had this shrewd man guessed about his weaknesses anyway? Again, Jammin flashed his kindly smile. Let me show you more of how we live, he said, 
as he led the way down the winding tower stairs. Through several corridors they went to the castle kitchen, where some men and women were busily preparing food for meals to be served later in the day. We have no servants, Jamin said, for the king, when he was here, said, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. These people are soldiers of the king, just like the rest of us. That is a strange rule, thought Lannis to himself. And what is even more strange is the way these people quote the king's sayings as though they were their only guides. Out through a door into the open air they went to the rear yard of the castle. Here in large gardens other men and women were hard at work, between the rows of growing things. This too, said Jamin, is work which must be done each day. Preparing food for the soldiers of the king is a most important duty. Then Jamin led the way back into the castle and through more passages to the unfinished section of the building, where several soldiers were at work trimming, smoothing, and laying the stonework on a partially erected castle tower. Stripped to the waist and wet with perspiration, they tugged and lifted the huge stones into position, spread and smoothed the mortar, and finished the joints. This work, said Jamin, is shared by every soldier. It is not as exciting as fighting with the enemy, but it is very necessary. For when the castle is finally finished, the king will return to the valley again. Every stone that we lay is bringing that time nearer. As they left the stonemasons, Lannis asked, Why is it, Jamin, that these soldiers wear their swords, even when laying stone? Doesn't the extra weight make their work harder? Jamin answered, We must be ready at all times for the enemy, who often attacks when we least expect him. When the alarm sounds, every soldier must be ready to fight. So whether we work in the gardens, clean the castle halls, or build the tower higher, we wear our swords and have our shields and helmets at hand. By this time they had passed through the castle and reached the grassy yard in front of the main entrance, where two young soldiers were practicing swordsmanship under the direction of an older man. One of our most important duties, said Jamin, is studying the use of our weapons. It takes long hours of practice to become a real swordsman. They crossed the yard to the gate in the castle wall. Next, I want to show you one of our outposts. Jamin said as he led the way through the gate. Outside, he skirted the castle wall to the side farthest from Broad Valley, then struck out along the mountainside following a well-worn path. A short walk brought them to a clearing where a group of soldiers were busily building higher some earth and timber barricades. As they approached this company, Lannis said suddenly, Look, there's Robin! And sure enough, there he was, his muscles straining and his blonde hair shining in the sun. Robin was helping to carry a heavy log from the edge of the wood to a position on one of the barricades. After the log was laid in place, Jamin called to him and Robin came, brushing the perspiration from his face with the back of his hand. He grinned at Lannis as he came up. I'm sorry I haven't been able to be with you, Lannis, he said, but you see, I'm a woodchopper today. Is there this much work to do here every day? asked Lannis, wondering at the flurry of activity. No, replied Robin, this is rather an emergency. You see, shortly after you and I were attacked on the path last night, the enemy staged a full-scale raid on this outpost and nearly captured it. The detachment on duty beat them off after a stiff fight, but not before the barricades were pretty well destroyed. We must repair and strengthen them today so that if the enemy attacks again tonight, the post can be defended. Is there any connection, asked Lannis, between the fight you had on the path last night and the attack here? This time it was Jammin who answered, Indeed there is, lad. The enemy dislikes everything we do, but what makes him angriest is when we persuade folks from the valley to visit us. You see, he knows that the people of the valley belong to him, and he fears that if they visit the castle, they may become followers of the king. Now, this outpost doesn't protect the path directly, but if the enemy can damage our defense line anywhere, he can keep us so busy rebuilding it that we have no time to visit the valley with invitations from the king. I see, said Lannis. When the enemy learned that Robin had brought me from the valley, he decided it was time to stir up trouble for you. That's right, said Robin, and as you see... He's kept ten of us busy all day repairing the damage. Just then a whistle shrilled from across the clearing. 
Sounds as though we are ready for another log, said Robin. I must get back to my job. Jim and will take care of you, Lannis, and I'll see you at the end of the day. And with a wave of his hand, he ran off to join a group at the forest's edge. Jammin and Lannis stood watching the work for a few more moments, then turned back towards the castle. On the way, they passed two soldiers carrying large kettles of steaming food toward the hill they had just left. Jammin turned with a smile. You see, Lannis, it is lunchtime already. Robin and his friends will be served at their post, but there will be food waiting for us at the castle. And lunch was indeed waiting for them in the castle hall. The food was delicious, and Lannis who found that the mountain air had made him hungry, ate heartily. Afterward, with Jammin, he took a walk through the castle grounds to see the beautiful flowers and fruits which grew there. When they returned, Jammin led the way to the castle library. Here were shelves and shelves of books filled with writings about the king and the castle. I must go for a while and tend to my duties, said Jammin, taking a large book from the shelf. I... We'll leave here with you the king's book, which will answer many of your questions. This wonderful book was prepared by men under the direction of the king, and it is filled with his wisdom. Read it carefully, for its words are words of life. When Jamin had left, Lannis found a comfortable chair and began to leaf idly through the book. But soon his attention was caught by the meaning of the words before him. Here in this book was the whole story of the Broad Valley of the king and of the evil ones. Here was just what he wanted to know. Lannis settled down deeper into his chair and began to read in earnest. 